Yeah. I, I welcome uh, everyone on behalf of uh, Civil, the Center for Wisdom and Leadership. And uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Justin Rienza. And we are very happy to host him. Uh, he is uh, going to present on a very interesting topic of uh, wise reasoning. And uh, his paper uh, in Nature's Communication was really wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, some of you uh, must have read, uh, read it already. Uh, just to give a brief profile of uh, Dr. Brienza, uh, he did his undergraduate study from University of uh, Toronto, Canada, and he got an opportunity to uh, study philosophy of mind, AI and cognitive science, psychology. And from there, he started working in, uh, in the area of wise reasoning during his, uh, uh, during his PhD. And his publications uh, have been appearing in, all, in many uh, top tier journals. Right now, he is lecturer at UQ Business School, and uh, uh, he's, uh, his efforts are aimed at applying wise reasoning to common workplace challenges. And that is where, uh, on a similar topic, he will be ha uh, presenting uh, today's uh, presentation. So very welcome, uh, Dr. Justin, and uh, we are very excited to, uh, to learn and to know more about wise reasoning. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Are you uh, are you on the full screen, or you can? Uh, is it looking like a PowerPoint? No, like, it's it's on full screen. You can see the slide. Okay. Okay. In good. Slide mode, it, it's presentation mode. Okay. Good. Uh, let me, just let me know if anything looks you know, weird or something happens. So first, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the invitation, SBJ Institute, um, Center for Wisdom and Leadership, and Professor Surya Tohora. Uh, I appreciate this invitation. Um, it's a privilege for me to be able to be speaking with you today. Um, just as a little bit of uh, introduction, as I started my research career, I was highly motivated to, um, look at wisdom in organizations, wisdom at work. Um, I wanted to conduct science of wisdom at work. And the reason behind this was I noticed a lot of the same problems that happen in organizations over and over again, doesn't matter what kind of organization um, they are. Um, we have complex problems in organizations um, that are um, not going to be able to be solved just by straight up intelligence. Um, we have um, issues like discrimination, we have problems cooperating at work, we have conflicts. These are complex problems that, according to theory, require um, a discussion and application of, of wisdom. But also, because organizations are our whole life, basically, not just work, not just school, um, our families are organizations, our religions are organizations, our politics our nations, um, how we be behave with each other within nations, how nations behave with each other and our society as a whole. We've come so far in technology. Um, we can meet today through Zoom, people we've never met before, but we still can't manage to cooperate properly. We still have biases that control what we do and constant conflict. These problems um, require wisdom in my view. And so that's what I was motivated to do. Now, the problem was when I started, there wasn't really a good way to conduct a science of wisdom in organizations. So basically, I had to start from scratch and create a way that I felt was more applicable than what was existing and conduct several tests to make sure that this is a valid way of looking at uh, some aspect of wisdom. And just so I can be clear ahead of time, um, I don't think that wise reasoning is wisdom. I think that going back to Ali's presentation on the pillars of wisdom, this is just one, one pillar. And it's one pillar that I'm interested in because it's we're able to actually conduct a science on it. It's a process. And that's what I'm interested in. How can we improve the processes of wisdom at work so that we can improve our experience at work and the outcomes? Okay, so um, just a basic introduction. Um, you, you gave a good introduction already. 
Um, I started off doing my Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Science and AI, and also it was a double major. I also did psychology, so I studied, um, we you know, weird things like Jungian psychology and psychology of religion. But in the Cognitive Science and AI, I was mostly on the philosophy side, asking deep questions. What is consciousness? What is human experience? What is intelligence? And ultimately, um, a lot of these questions ended up pointing to this question of wisdom. What is it? And mostly that's what we focused on. What is it? And I was fortunate enough to study under professors like John Verveke and Evan Thompson, um, who are amazing scholars and really um, planted the seed uh, in me. The other seed that was planted in me came from 15 years of work pre-PhD. <clears throat> Again, um, I perceived these persistent problems of at work. They were consistent problems. Um, I, I worked in a lot of different industries and I played a lot of different roles, um, including right at the very bottom, blue collar worker, as well as supervisor in, in industries in the arts. I saw the same problems. Okay, there's a lot of imbalanced decision making, conflicts, bias, lack of cooperation, lack of efficiency. Actually, one of that was one of the first things that really bothered me was the amount of waste that happens in organizations because people are spending so much time on their stresses, on their cognitive load, um, talking to each other about how to handle problems rather than actually doing their job. And technically, I thought people could come in and work for four hours and go home and enjoy the rest of their day. But that rest of the day was spent in anxiety and fighting with each other. So I thought to myself, this is a very uh, frustrating situation for me, something that caused me to, to lose a little bit of sleep. And I thought if I'm going to be losing sleep about it, it might as well be my job to look at these problems. And so I went to do a master's and PhD in, in, in uh, organizational psychology, and I was in a quantitative uh, stream. And so my concern was, I think I'm, you know, a super smart person. And I think I have the answers to all these problems. And I'm going to go in and do my PhD, and I'm going to change the world, right? Uh, not so easy. Um, but the question still uh, remained, I want to know, how can we do better? How can we feel better at work? How can we be more productive? How can we um, study and improve leadership. Um, that's another one of those persistent problems that I noticed was that as people rise to the top, uh, they tend to almost get more foolish um, in some ways, less authentic, more biased. Uh, we still have problems with favoritism and things like that. And that's what I wanted to study. And coming back all the way full circle from my uh, Bachelor of Science, my motivation was to conduct the science of wisdom at work, um, and I was lucky enough to have uh, Professor Igor Grossman join the school exactly at the time that I was trying to do that. So just to be clear, in this presentation, when I'm saying I did this or I did that, I did nothing on my own. Um, all of my, um, I mean, I, I think I've had some creative ideas, but the seeds were planted by other people and I was nurtured by other people as well. And I continue to be nurtured by some people who are in this meeting. Um, so beginning my research, I began to do a, a, try to do a thorough search of the literature on quantitative uh, wisdom, um, as I think um, has probably already been discussed at least a, a little bit um, in, in these meetings, or if you've looked into the wisdom literature, you know that it did not start, obviously, in organizations. That's why I want to do it. Um, there's been research on wisdom in aging research and personality um, and application of, of knowledge. So there's a lot of different theories uh, of wisdom. And from my viewing of it, <clears throat> one of the common threads that I noticed was that most theories highlight the importance of reflection or reasoning. Okay, so facing um, our ability to reflect wisely or to reason wisely through our challenges can help us um, to face them wisely. Right? So in the aging research, that was more about you know, maintaining resilience in the face of cognitive and physical uh, declines. Um, but I wanted to bring that into the, the, the workplace. 
Okay, so even these personality measures, they, they include a dimension of reflection uh, or cognition. Um, the application of knowledge theories uh, mentioned here with Baltas and Staudinger and also Grossman, um, these by definition include reasoning component because they ask people to, um, they, they place people into a dilemma and ask them how to, how they would reason through that. I think most importantly for me, um, reasoning is a process, okay, that can be applied and can be tested in different contexts. And this is what I wanted, um, wanted to do, okay. Personality um, the, is mostly a stable thing. Um, there's a hereditary component. What I don't want to do is go into workplaces and say, well, we should, we should only hire people who are rating high on these wis wisdom scales. Is to produce um, a better understanding of a process of wisdom that all of us can do. And this goes right back to um, the thoughts about wise leadership as well. Um, before I started even doing this more general wisdom scale, I actually wrote a wise leadership scale. And the problem is, is that we have some, all of us have some choice in who we accept as leaders and who we vote in or who we choose as leaders. And we still choose foolish people. So I think all of us need to become a little bit wiser. And if we do, um, um, everything counts in large amounts. And that can create a sort of culture that can sort of bootstrap it, it itself eventually. But we can't do that unless we have rigorous testing of these ideas to see if they really work, um, to see if they're really productive in producing um, wisdom. It's, it's difficult for me to give recommendations unless I've seen some uh, reliable testing happen and um, consistent results. Okay, so um, again, I wanted to do the science of wisdom, but there was not really a, a good way to, to do that. There were issues with the quantitative methods to assess wisdom at the time. Again, those are going back to the scales I mentioned before, um, Ardell scale and, and Webster scale, and even the application of knowledge scales that Baltes and Staudinger use. So the aging and personality measures are, are not really focused on a process. Okay, so I want to focus on a process because that's something that I can choose to do. I can train that in my employees. Um, I can practice it myself. I can become better at it. Okay, so those were focused more on traits and stable traits. And those don't really give too much um, wiggle room for how we can improve um, in our everyday life. Um, they are not context specific, right? So they look at only the individual um, and they test how people, um, how this trait relates to other outcomes in the abstract and in general, a lot of the times. So they're not really um, producing insights that we can use for how to become wiser in our everyday. Uh, personality measures were not consistent, uh, reliable. Um, the problem here is that because these scales are self-report um, and they deal with um, socially desirable traits, the scales themselves are um, sort of undermined by socially desirable responding. So um, uh, self-deception uh, and impression management. Um, and application of knowledge measures, um, interviews and coding of how people reason through problems, of course, that is very relevant and that is what I'm trying to tap into. But the problem with those is that they're not efficient. They're very costly. They take forever to do the interviews. Then they have to um, employ coders to code um, and score all of these interviews. And that is not something that most organizational um, scholars have time to do. It's very high risk. And what I'm looking for is something that can appeal broadly. I want more organizational scholars to look at wisdom because I think it is that important um, for us. And they're not going to do that if it's not efficient. Um, and they're not going to do it if it's not reliable or valid either. Okay, so at the time, um, there was not really a good way for me to do the research that I wanted to do. Okay, so my solution was, um, if it doesn't exist, don't give up. 
um, just create it yourself. And so that's what I did. So basically, this is a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I consider this phase one of my research um, to start from scratch and do a reconceptualization, create a new method to assess the wise reasoning, and then conduct some sort of large scale tests um, um, that are generalizable and to sort of set a precedent um, that can show the organizational um, literature that this is something that they are um, not going to be screwed over if they go down this path and, and use this to, to do research on wisdom. Okay, so the first step was to create the measure. I want to know, is this measure reliable? Is it valid? And then I conducted uh, predictive tests, which each of these are separate publications, uh, wise reasoning on cooperation, wise reasoning related to reduced bias, um, and what are some of the contextual um, uh, situations that can either undermine or improve people's ability to use uh, wise reasoning. And these goals go back right back to my initial uh, problem statement. You know, we have all of these organizations, we're good at everything else, technology and so on, but we can't seem to cooperate even as a society or even in, in workplaces. And we're marred by um, social bias and cognitive biases. So that's why I focused on these elements. Okay, so phase one, the goal again was to design, design a new measure. Um, and the, these are the following criteria that I used to choose how I was putting this measure together. So first, I want to focus on pro process. Organizational scholars are always looking for implications. What can we do with this to fix the problems that we're having? OK, so I focus on process because it gives clear implications for what we can do. It has to be context sensitive. We need to be able to bring it into different contexts. I think it's pretty well accepted that some contexts will require more wisdom than others, um, and that different contexts can undermine people's ability to perform in that way. It has to be efficient, again, as I mentioned, um, uh, for people to actually use it. So it has to be self-report. I want to do large-scale studies um, on thousands of people so that my findings are reliable. Unfortunately, that means that it has to be self-report, but uh, we have to find a way to make that still reliable and valid, even though it's self-report. So we want it to not be confounded by socially desirable response bias, and it has to be construct valid and predictive, uh, predictively valid. Okay, so it has to actually, scores on this measure have to actually point to the outcomes that we think of when uh, we're talking about wisdom. And it has to be consistent with the majority of, of existing wisdom theories. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, this wise reasoning or reflection is a common element between a lot of different um, wisdom theories. So my solution was to use these criteria to design a new hybrid measure of wise reasoning. So before um, uh, going on, oh, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned, um, I am not, I can't really see what you guys are doing. So um, if you have a question or you want to challenge anything I'm saying or get in an argument or something, just interrupt me. I don't mind. Okay, so what is wise reasoning? <clears throat> this is a very sort of simplified um, version of, of, of uh, wise reasoning. It looks how I've set this up on the screen. It looks like this is sort of a stepwise process. Um, we haven't really done research on the order of the different steps. This is just the way I like to present it because it makes sense to me. So the first one here at the top is intellectual humility. Acknowledging the limits of one's own, uh, one's own understanding and taking action to improve one's understanding. So why is this important? If you think about it, if you're in a situation and you think you know everything, then you can just make a decision. And I think that's part of the problem um, uh, in organizations is that we have a lot of comp confident people who believe they know what is right and they don't realize whether their knowledge is lacking and they don't realize whether they're acting on bias. So this is an important element because it opens the door 
for the person to understand if I don't know everything, that means that there's some information out there that I should be looking for to build up my understanding so that I can make a better decision. My assumption is that nobody out there is really saying, hey, I, I really just want to make horrible decisions. I think people want to make good decisions. It's just that they're very proud and they're lazy. So this step opens the door. So how are we going to find more information um, that helps us to make a better decision? Uh, first step to me is contextualism. So situations can look sort of the same to us at the surface, but each situation is different. So we need to look for extenuating circumstances and situational causes of social challenges. Once we find those um, situational uh, factors, we have a better understanding of how this problem um, uh, arose, then we're less likely to simply cast blame on other people. Uh, we're less likely to think that oh, we're just a victim. Okay. After we've looked at the context and we have a more nuanced view of how the situation occurred, um, comes perspectivism. Okay. Taking other people's perspectives, maybe their view um, either the other person that we might be in a conflict with or the other group or a third person onlooker can add nuance to your understanding. Okay, so I think we've all seen this picture where there's two people um, and there's a number um, below them and one's looking at it from this direction and the other one's looking at it from the other direction. One person says it's a nine and the other person says it, it's a six. From both of their perspectives, they're both correct. But from the outside, we can see that they're both correct and they're both incorrect in some ways. That adds nuance to our, our understanding and we're able to potentially intervene in that situation and explain it um, to them or explain it to ourselves better once we've taken those different perspectives. And finally, we have dialecticism. Um, this is the sort of the element of balance that's in the scale efforts to integrate different interests for synergetic solutions. This idea of synergy is used a lot in negotiations, uh, and negotiations can be um, similar to conflict in that you're looking for uh, a solution that is win-win, something that um, taps into the greater good. Maybe we don't have to leave this negotiation with one person winning and the other person losing, but perhaps there's a better way that we can create good out of this bad situation. Okay, so taking that, um, those concepts. No, Justin, um, sorry, uh, can I interrupt? Yeah. 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 I, have, I have a query. Uh, yeah, so, sure. uh, I, I'm just curious to know that how did you arrive at these four dimensions of wise reasoning? Um, so- On what basis or, uh, or just, just, a, just a question. Yeah, so these are some of the common elements that have been used um, previously by Baltes and Staudinger. And before I started um, doing this research, um, I mentioned before that um, Professor Grossman came to Waterloo where I was at, um, and he had already come out with a paper in, in 2010. So it was, and I was working with him. Um, so we basically went into these, but there's, um, there's quite a bit of work um, we have a paper in Psych Inquiry that details those are sort of coming from philosophical uh, traditions, um, um, uncertainty and change, uncertain uh, intellectual humility comes from Socrates, um, change and uncertainty also comes from the I Ching. So these are from cross-cultural philosophies of wisdom, trying to sort of bring them all together. And when we're measuring them on a scale, Part of the test that we wanted to do was to see, do these different dimensions that are coming from different areas of, of uh, wisdom theory, if they're all supposed to be wise reflections, then that means that they would correlate strongly. And so that's part of the testing that we did with this measure. So we have these different dimensions and we see, <clears throat> do they all correspond? If, if a person is... Um, being intellectually humble in this situation, are they also more likely to take another perspective? Or are, are they also more likely to try to, um, you know, get a win-win solution? And I, and I think it, it makes sense. If, if somebody is being intellectually humble and they're taking different perspectives and they know that they don't know everything and that things can change, 
while probably they're going to be also more inclined to try to have a cooperative solution rather than just have it be like a one shot where they defect on the other person because you know that you're probably going to see that other person or need to rely on them again so we expected these things to correlate but that's actually one of the things that we tested uh, as well to see if they if they match up empirically thanks a lot thanks yeah. Just, um, do, do, yeah do you mind if i ask a, a question there too yeah yeah, yeah. sure um, I might just point out that Justin and I work at the same university, so uh, we, yeah. we we chat together, work together. But I just thought it might be useful uh, if if you wanted to elaborate on this, because I was just thinking of that you know that dialectal uh, dialecticalism that you referred to, um, <clears throat> and I think uh, there can be a philosophical issue in terms of like different conceptions of that, say from the Aristot Aristotelian, uh, I suppose more broadly the the Greek tradition of you know dialecticalism being that sort of exchange of different views and you know you know coming to some sort of mutual understanding versus um sort of like the hegelian and marxian view of dialectic where you have thesis and antithesis you know where they're just you know opposites that like capitalism and communism that you know are, are simply antithetical um and i just wondered whether um whether you see dialecticalism more in what I would call dialogism in that, you know, that you've got to have at least some sort of shared territory um, for dialogue, whereas dialectic, you, you know, you, you, you basically have people who have such different worldviews that it's almost impossible to, uh, you know, to, to come to some sort of agreement. I think so. Basically, um, I think that in terms of the scale, um, what what we're talking about is how to implement this, and I think it's implemented in a few ways. So again, that 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 um, you know that diagram that I said that I was sharing on the previous slide, it's it's yeah. overly simplistic, right? So in yeah, yeah. in one in one way, it's implemented through the idea that well, now that you've taken different perspectives you can you can re you can understand the differences in those views more accurately mm -hmm. right that doesn't mean that you necessarily accept what their view is yeah. but it it can go it but <clears throat> the more you know the better right so then once you know if it's thesis and antithesis or whatever then you you can still look for you you can see what's different and what's in common yeah, yeah. Uh, pot potentially. Um, and in the other way, um, it's implemented is through compromise. Again, compromise is used differently in different uh, fields, I think. Um, we mean it more as a sort of collaborative, not, not like, oh, we have to meet in the middle with everything. Of course, like in these in challenging situations, sometimes there is going to be a, you know, a right and a wrong way of doing things if something mm. is is purely destructive for no reason just to eliminate the the competition that's getting into that's getting into territory of you know world war ii territory or yeah. um, a lot of a lot of re religions want to just have all of the other religions eliminated so that you can have peace well that's not really peace that's just like killing everybody off right so <laughs> So, so we we want to have there's multiple ways i i hope that's answering your question it's not yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of tapping into it in in multiple different ways and and it it is not really clear boundaries as clear as it looked on that on that previous slide so like yeah there's oh. there's there's uh, items that that are asking about whether you took someone else's perspective but that's also is involved in the dialecticism and how you apply that so in the scale it's like well did you look for a way to create a resolution that benefits both of you well the i mean you have to at least think about it you at least have to look and that's what the scale is asking it's not whether you were able to do it and that's one of the shortcomings i think is that well it's not actually a shortcoming because we can use that scale to predict whether people actually did were better able to come up with a shared solution yeah. Yeah. it's it's more about them in this in this case it's more about how people reasoned and there is 
definitely a motivational element that we have not really done really good research on finding what those motivational elements are. Like what is going to motivate a person to, aside from the intellectual humility, what's going to motivate a person to, to do this in the first place. But I get around to that a little bit with the discussion of context later. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So I just want to talk a very as briefly as possible about how this new measure works because um, just so you you know, it's nothing like super complicated. It's still a self-report scale and it still has problems with self-report scales, but it um, we were able to sort of eliminate some of the problems that the other wisdom scales had in terms of memory bias and social desirability. Um, uh, marring those those scales. So if you think about it, if you if you think about wisdom, you, you think that, that person who's wise is probably has less bias, right? They're they're more um, they're making better decisions that are more independent of intergroup bias or egocentric biases. Well, if the scale that you're using is actually tapping into those bias or is biased itself, then the whole endeavor that you're doing is sort of undermined. So to sort of get rid of this, we looked into the literature on improving self-report methods, and we found this method called the event reconstruction method uh, designed by Kahneman. And you can find that in uh, Science Journal in 2004, Kahneman and Schwartz um, and their colleagues. And basically what they do is they, instead of asking people just to respond how you felt at the time or whatever, that those responses are already going to be biased by the fact that that happened two, day, two days ago and you've built up some rationalization for how you reacted and you told yourself that you're okay or you told yourself you're the worst and then you respond in a way that's biased. So what they did was they asked people to first recall the situation and then try to rebuild the context around the event rather than just focusing on themselves and the social desirability way of, of thinking about the self and, and responding. So they ask simple questions. And this is what we do in our measure. We ask, where were you? Um, what time, what day was it? What time of day? And that is theoretically, and we found it was actually successful when in reducing social desirability responses, okay? After doing this, um, the uh, study participants will respond to our 21 wise reasoning items. Um, and they're very simple items. So for example, intellectual humility, I double checked whether my opinion of the problem was incorrect. Um, for contextualism, I, I looked for any uh, extraordinary circumstances before forming my opinion. Um, for perspectivism, I tried to take the other person's perspectives. And dialecticism, this is just one example, considered whether a compromise was possible for resolving the situation. Is there, is there any questions about that? <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is the results, very, very uh, high order and very briefly, because I don't want to, this is actually a massive paper um, and I, I'm not going to go through it. It's actually quite boring because it's a scale validation paper. But in brief, we found that the items were reliable. So they tend to all cluster together. But the structure that we had a priori sort of theorized, we we it it was a little bit different than we first theorized because we were thinking that there was going to be seven dimensions, and it turned out the five that there was five dimensions fit the data better. Um, and later on, we find slightly different factor structures um, as well. Uh, and lately, I've been finding four factors rather than five. But as an entire scale, it fits together really well. And we find that it predicts, it predicts the outcomes that we're looking for a lot better when we include all of the items rather than when we just look at each of the individual uh, dimensions um, on their own. But for us, that sort of confirmed the idea that these different forms of wise, wise reasoning that were mentioned in different areas of philosophy and psychology that they actually do correspond together and people are doing one of them, they also tend to do uh, the other ones. So for convergent and discriminant validity, the important thing here is that we want to show that a scale relates to the things that we think theoretically it should and doesn't relate um, or discriminate from 
um, the things that we don't want it to relate to. So for convergent validity, we found that um, what basically what we would expect, it is uh, related to openness, um, agreeableness, mindfulness, emotion regulation, active open-minded thinking. It's also related, but not too strongly, to the other wisdom scales. So we found correlations. I think it was around 0.4 or, or 0.5. Once you get to a correlation that's above about 0.7, um, you start to question whether those are separate constructs or whether they're actually one thing, but we found that they are um, the correlations are me medium-sized. And importantly, we found that this scores on this measure was, were not confounded by social desirability. We conducted the same tests that have been conducted in previous research, for example, um, by uh, Gluck and, and colleagues. Um, and like them, we found that the other wisdom measures, the trait personality measures, were related to social desirability, but our new scale uh, was not. Um, we did some predictive validity tests in this paper. Um, so we found, we, we uh, tried to correlate um, wise reasoning scores with some cognitive uh, egocentric cognitive biases, for example, bias blind spot. Bias blind spot is basically the tendency to think that other people are biased, but I am not, um, which is not true. Um, we're all biased on average. So people who show that tendency are tend to be actually more biased than they think and more biased than other people. And we found that wise reasoning was negatively related to that and negatively related to attributional biases. So you get, so even if you're not in psychology, you've probably heard of fundamental attribution error where people are more likely, at least in the West, when something goes wrong, we're more likely to blame the person rather than the situation. Um, and we found that that was not the case for people who um, were scoring higher on, on wise reasoning. Um, and predictive validity too, uh, we tested some indices of balance. So we found that wise reasoning was related to more balanced attitude and decision-making and goals. So within people's own conflicts, we asked them, what was your motivation? Was it more to influence the other person to do whatever you want or to take your perspective? Or were you completely adjusting to their point of view? we found that people who scored higher on wise reasoning were more likely to do both sort of evenly. And the same thing for blame. Uh, people who were lower on wise reasoning were more likely to just blame the other person for the situation, which um, I think technically is literally impossible. If everybody's just saying it's always everybody else's fault, that's like impossible. So we found that people who are scored higher on wise reasoning were more realistic in their attributions of blame in their own conflicts and more likely to accept some of the blame themselves. I think that's an important finding because I think a lot of the problems in conflict is that we're usually have this tendency to try to hold ourselves as being perfect or being a victim, not really taking responsibility for our place in the conflict. And when that happens, of course, we're not going to usually come up with a resolution. At that point, we start getting into an intractable conflict. Um, any questions about that? So if not, I'm going to start getting into the predictive tests. Um, again, um, my overarching um, issue uh, with organizations in my experience and uh, was basically that why can't we just cooperate better? Um, why are we still making these decisions based on biases, even though we know that we should be cooperating more and we know that we're biased, but we still keep doing it. And these are problems for leadership too. Um, so the first predictive test was cooperation. How does wise reasoning relate to cooperation? Why cooperation? Workplaces present conflicts of interest to employees. Organizations use this fancy wisdom language. They want everybody to get along, but they actually set the context where workers are motivated to act in self-interest and self-promotion. So we have this sort of uh, dilemma in organizations. There are organizations kind of shoot themselves in the foot 
by demanding things of employees that are sort of contrary to each other. I think this gets back to the dialecticism comment that, that you made, um, uh, Bernard. So how can we resolve or balance this uh, conflict? Uh, right around the time that we were validating this measure, um, a real uh, big uh, paper came out in Nature by Rand and Green and Nowak, and they had shown that reasoning tends to reduce cooperation. So this was a problem for me. I don't want organizations to think less just so that they can cooperate more. Um, I want people to be more thoughtful. I think if we're more thoughtful, we'll be more wise um, in our organizations, especially leaders. So this was something that sort of irked me. But what they found that was that when people take more time to think about the situations that they're in, they're more likely to reduce their cooperation. When they have no time to think at all, they're sort of by default cooperative. The idea is this is uh, uh, underlying this is that because when you start to think about these dilemmas that we're in, and in their studies, it was economic games, right? So when you start to think about that situation, you have a sort of a conflict of interest. You might want to cooperate, but it's a situation that's sort of a dilemma and you, you don't know if you should. So just to be safe, people tend to move more to the defect option rather than uh, cooperation. The implication again of this is that reflecting on work situations would actually reduce cooperation between employees. This is problematic because that means everything else at work will probably go down the tubes if people are just not thinking. So my question was, what kind of thinking? In their studies, they didn't ask people what kind of thinking they were doing. They didn't try to test that in any way. All they did was track the amount of time people made making a decision and inferred that in that time, they were thinking and the more thinking related to less cooperation. So our question was, can wise reasoning improve cooperation? Okay, so when people are thinking, some people are going to be thinking in one way and other people are going to be thinking in another way. We thought that people who are thinking in a wise reasoning way would actually um, cooperate more. Okay, so we conducted three studies um, to test this hypothesis. Um, this was published in 2017. In these studies, we gave people a public goods game. So in this game, they're paired with three other people for a group task. We give them a bonus and we tell them that each of them and their partners who they don't see, they're anonymous, they can each contribute part or all or none of their bonus. All of the contributions will be taken by us, doubled and split evenly between all members of the group, regardless of who cooperated more or less. So you can see this sort of like dilemma uh, the nature of, of this um, dilemma of self-interest versus group interests. Okay, so in these studies, we measured or experimentally manipulated wise reasoning in participants, and then they do this task, and we either manipulate or we measured the time spent thinking about the cooper cooperation decision. And our question was, does wise reasoning moderate this effect of time on cooperation. So here's what we found. Again, this is very uh, basic. Um, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. But if you look here on, can you guys, can you see my mouse moving here? Or, or do you yes. see any? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Good. Perfect. So on the x-axis here, this is in this study, we measured wise reasoning using the scale. And over here, we have lower scores. And over here, we have higher scores. And over on the uh, y-axis, we have cooperation. What is the percentage of their bonus that they contributed to the group project? And the different colors are the different conditions that we had. So in the darker bars, we, we restricted the amount of time that people could use to make their decision. In the control condition, we didn't mention anything at all. So they could just naturalistically do whatever. And in the time delay condition, we specifically asked people to think about this decision for at least 10 seconds, okay? So here's what we found. Um, if you look at the no time situation, there's, there's no effect 
of Y's reasoning, these are not significantly different. And it's easy to imagine why. If people have no time to think, then their Y's reasoning doesn't matter, right? In the control condition, uh, we didn't know what to expect here. This is just naturalistic, but we didn't give any instructions. And again, here, we didn't find any significant difference between high and low wise reasoning. This is the important condition. So when we actually told people to think about their decision, this is when we cue whether someone is a wise reasoner or a not wise reasoner. And this is exactly where we found the effect. Okay, so when people were lower in wise reasoning and we asked them to think about their decision, they tended to cooperate even less and much more when they were higher in wise reasoning. So this is actually about a 30, I think a one third difference or 30% difference or something like that. I think that's actually um, quite, well, it was significant, but I mean, it's significant if you try to put it into practical terms in say an organization, when people are in sort of a, a culture of, of uh, competition or something like that, it would, uh, one third of a difference in cooperation can do a lot. Um, okay, so then there was, we had studies two and three. Um, this, these graphs are a little bit different. So on the y-axis here, we have the decision time. So the amount of time that they took to make a decision. And then again, here on the y-axis, we have um, the level of contribution or cooperation. We find exactly what they found in the normal condition with the black line here we found exactly what they find. So as people spend more time, they tend to cooperate less in both studies. And you can see that arc. Um, and in both studies, we found that people who are in a wise reasoning condition, in this case, we manipulated wise reasoning experimentally. And we found that that slope was non-existent here and much, um, much less steep in, in this condition. Any questions about that? Oops, sorry. Okay, so one last check that we did in this paper is we actually wanted to see how people reported their motivations, um, why they made their decision to cooperate or not cooperate. Um, so here uh, we have people, when it says normal here, that's just the condition that's not a wise reasoning ex uh, experiment. And the gray bars here are when we manipulated wise reasoning. Okay, so we, what we found was that when we manipulated wise reasoning, and we asked people to do this, they were more likely to highlight their motivations to um, provide benefits to the entire group rather than just themselves. Whereas in the normal condition where we didn't highlight wise reasoning, people were more likely to make a decision based on their own, just their own benefit as an individual. Okay. So participants who were in the wise reasoning condition had more interdependent motivations. And the way I see it, that sort of taps into this idea of the greater good, which we expect um, wise people to be more oriented toward the, the greater good. We want wise leaders to be oriented toward the greater good rather than just benefiting them, themselves. Okay, so the implication is that because wise reasoning is a process, then it can be trained and practiced. If we are nudging wise reasoning at work or in organizations or in any social life, we could potentially improve interdependence mindset, mindset or even the culture itself um, if, it, if enough people are doing it and that this could improve um, cooperation and charitable be behaviors between different people at work. Okay, predictive test number two. I'm not conscious of the time uh, because I can't see the time here. But if I'm rambling, what's that? One hour. It's 54 minutes since we started. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so the second predictive test um, was how does wise reasoning relate to bias? And we touched on this briefly in the validation paper, um, but uh, for my interests, I wanted to do something that was much more larger scale. Some I wanted to look at a bias that is really a problem in society today, <clears throat> and that is intergroup bias. So we find that polarization, intergroup bias, 
um, outgroup hostility and in-group love are global problems that are causing issues and conflicts all around the world. They're determining, in fact, um, even how people vote. And Bernard and Ali and I have a paper that's going to be coming out soon about this, that we found that polarization is actually the strongest predictor of people voting for Trump in the 2020 um, elections. So we want to be able to sort of tap into this. Is there anything that can tap into this sort of insidious monster that's happening nowadays? And I thought if we could show that wise reasoning can actually improve or reduce polarization at the intergroup level, then that would be a strong test uh, of how wise reasoning relates to the outcomes that we want to see. And, and also, because these issues bleed into the workplace, it doesn't have to be about ethnicity or race or things like that. Even when we're talking about um, interdisciplinary collaboration, they have problems because they come from different groups. If you're trying to get a group of engineers to talk to uh, a group of designers or something like that, they don't have as good crosstalk as they do within their, their groups. They don't have good crosstalk across groups because they have those biases there. Okay, so there's all kinds of problems in organizations that happen because of this. The most obvious ones is racism, discrimination, conflicts, um, uh, negotiations gone wrong. If you think of um, unions and management negotiations, um, failure of diversity. This one's a big one to me because my whole life, uh, I came from Canada. My whole life, people have been preaching about how awesome diversity is, but it fails so often. And the reason it fails is because when you have diverse groups, they have this polarization and intergroup bias, and they end up getting in more conflicts rather than doing what we think that they ideally in an ideal world should, which is be more creative, come up with more entrepreneurial um, decisions. Okay, um, so our question here was, can wise reasoning reduce polarization and reduce hostility or increase charitability toward outgroup members? So we conducted seven studies um, across different uh, intergroup conflicts around the world. Um, this paper was published in 2021. Uh, participants were recruited, who we recruited were people who belonged to in-groups and or out-groups in the specific conflicts that uh, we chose. So these were different conflicts in different areas. So we did the um, Occupy movement in Hong Kong. We did the same-sex uh, marriage debate in the United States. Uh, we did the immigration debate in the UK and the United States. And then we did another study focused on um, outgroups in the COVID um, situation as well. In these studies, we first asked participants to, instead of um, the 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 normal measure of wise reasoning is to get people to think about their own conflicts. In these studies, we asked people to reflect on the intergroup conflict that was happening at the time. And the way we did this was to ask them to read a brief news clipping about the conflict. And then they reported their feelings toward the outgroup and the in-group. And what we expected, again, was to show this sort of polarized feelings where people are much more likely to rate their in-group as very positive and the outgroup is very negative. Um, but we expected that hopefully wise reasoning would sort of balance that out so that the ratings would be less uh, polarized. So in these studies, we either measured again or experimentally manipulated wise reasoning. And our question was, can wise re reasoning reduce intergroup polarization? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, this is just a sample result. You'll see here, it doesn't really tell you who the groups are or what conflict it is. Um, so we're not trying to say um, this is one specific group. Um, as you'll see, I think I have in the next slide, um, you'll see the same pattern happen over and over again in these studies. Basically on the x-axis here, we have wise reasoning. And this in this study, it was measured. So we use this, the Swiss measure. And over here on the y-axis, we have target positivity. 
So what that means is they, they rated both the in-group and the out-group. So the circles and the dashed line is the in-group targets and the triangles and the solid line is the out-group target, okay? So if we look first at how people rated their own in-group, yes, they were more positive, but there was no effect of wise reasoning. You see the slope here is not significant and it makes sense. Okay, if we're thinking about our own in-group, we don't need wise reasoning because that's just like ourself. So we can just have a sort of consistent rating of them. Um, and that was actually a positive to us. I think if we found a similar slope, if this was going like this, then we would have a problem because wise reasoning would then only just rate to relate to more positivity. And that's not what we're looking for. We want more balance, right? So when we're looking at ratings of the outgroup, here we is where we found the effect of wise reasoning. So when people are rating the outgroup, wise reasoning relates to more positive um, reactions toward the outgroup. Okay, so with low wise reasoning over here, we see exactly what we are seeing all around the world. Right, there's a lot of polarization there. People love the in-group and they hate the out-group. Actually, it's more about hate here than, than love because you see the scale only goes to 100 and this is just above the, the midpoint. So it's more about out-group hate. And now over here on wise reason, uh, stronger wise reasoning, we found that that's almost no difference. And in some studies, we found that difference was reduced but could be still significant. And in some cases, there was no um, difference at all. Okay, I don't know how to get rid of this pen now. Um, okay, right. So um, here's a bunch of uh, screenshots from other studies. And what you can see here is we find the same pattern across all of these different conflicts. So this one was in Hong Kong. Uh, this one was also in Hong Kong. We have uh, another one that I didn't post here was on the um, Black Lives Matter protests in Baltimore, the feelings toward the protesters and feelings toward the police. Uh, study five was um, in the same-sex marriage debate, feelings toward Christians and feelings toward um, gays and lesbians. And we find the same pattern. So we, with low wise reasoning, we find a lot of polarization and higher wise reasoning, we don't find um, polarization or at least not as much. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, I don't know how to get rid of this pen. Okay, anyway. Okay, so those are the two predictive tests that we conducted. Um, those are done. And uh, so now we wanna do uh, one big study at least on looking at context. If context is so important, then we should find that important context actually can have an effect on on wise reasoning, right? So one thing that this was actually this was actually the first reason why I started to design this scale is because I wanted to conduct um, this test on social class and status. My idea was that people who are high. This paper had come out recently, um, and this is a person from Toronto, so I kind of knew who they were, and they were doing research on social class. And I thought that wise reasoning or wisdom would sort of moderate the negative effects of social class on cooperation and, eth and ethics in organizations. Okay, so what they found is a lot of research showed that as people move up in social class in organizations and, and uh, not in organizations as well, um, they tended to be less ethical or less moral. And I thought that potentially this phenomenon could be explained because people in higher status positions start to neglect the perspectives of, of other people. They start to um, neglect intellectual humility. They think they're the best. They know everything. They have a lot of experience. And so they don't do wise reasoning as much and they end up doing unethical things. This, I think, clearly has important implications for wise leadership. We can start to understand that when leader, people move up into leadership positions, um, they start to behave in, in worse ways. 
and potentially because they're not doing wise reasoning. Okay. What I thought is that if we had a, a leader who was being more wise or um, using uh, more wise reasoning, that people's perceptions of them would be improved because they would seem more authentic. Um, they would be more moral. And so they actually would do a better job um, in, in general and get better uh, ratings from their followers. Okay, so the question here is, does higher social class undermine wise reasoning? <clears throat> Again, this could indicate a process by which wise leadership could be improved. Okay, so maybe we need to train wise reasoning and the practice of, of wise reasoning in workplaces. And actually, I have found some evidence of this in the C-suite training by a company called Corn Ferry. Um, they kind of tap into this in some um, interesting ways as well. Okay, so Justin, for this, yeah. Sorry, uh, just with that social class thing, I was just wondering, yeah. do you think it could be related to um, variables um, uh, like openness to experience, for example, or humility? Um, could be yeah. well for sure humility for sure yeah. Yeah. um openness uh yeah openness could be maybe uh, yeah, the, I, I say openness to experience because <clears throat> it, i often say that you know the more successful people are um the less uh incentive they have to change their habits because yeah, exactly. you know what they've done so far is you know prove successful so anyway, I'll just, I'll just put that thought in, that was all. Yeah, no, that's, I think exactly what you said it better than I, I said, a, I think I mentioned like ex, with more experience, we, okay, well, my intuition is great. So I'm always gonna make the best decisions. Meanwhile, you're making unwise decisions because you trust yourself too much, right? Um, I think that's the same thing can be said, um, you know, when we're talking about organizational change, yeah, the people at the top can, you know, make a, a motto of, yo, let's let's cr create change, let's do things differently. But actually, they don't want to do something differently because that's the system that makes that, you know, they've rose to the top in that situation. So they're they they like that uh, situation because it preserves their status. Same thing could be said, I think, within the head of an individual person. You know, I I can trust myself. Look how awesome I do. I've made all these great decisions. I'm, I'm now a leader because I'm good. Why would I listen to anybody else, right? So in this study, we didn't do this in organizations. Um, we did it in sort of a normal, uh, normal life context. Um, it was a large scale study. And then we had a, a smaller in-lab study. And we examined this relation between social class and wise reasoning. And the idea was that we thought that the higher status somebody was, the less wise reasoning that they would show. And to sort of triangulate on that question, we looked at it at multiple different levels. So we looked at it at the regional level. So all of our participants in the study were from different areas of the United States. So we have 2000 people. So we mapped them out to see where they were located um, in America. And we then coded where they were in terms of their state. So the state level averages of percentage of uninsured citizens is an index of status. Uh, percentage of people who were worried about financial issues. So there, I think there was seven different issues that um, is coded by IPOMS and yeah, I think it was IPOMS and, and Gallup, um, medical costs, monthly bills, be, being able to pay their bills. And we coded that along with occupational status. And we used that to see if that had a relation to, to wise reasoning. Then uh, at the personal level, we tested whether people's income and education as a personal level of social class or social economic status related to wise reasoning. And at the situational level, we simply asked people in their conflicts how, uh, what their subjective status was. So we asked them relative to the other person in the conflict, how much social status do you, did you feel that you had in that situation? Okay. Uh, so here's um, the first finding at the regional level. <clears throat> so when we map this out into different states, 
and the amount of social class of, uh, sorry, status of the state we have here, higher social status on the X axis, and then wise reasoning is on the Y axis, and we can see a strong slope here. You know, it's not, uh, I, I will say it is a bit messy, of course, but you can see the confidence intervals here right in, in the graph. So it is a significant um, and meaningful effect at that level. At the personal level, so again, this is um, education here. We're looking at uh, how education relates to wise reasoning on the y-axis. And you can see here, um, it's a, actually it's a little bit difficult to see, um, but if you start tracing the path here, you can see that there's a negative um, slope there. And so there's a negative relation. And you can also see that what appears to me anyway, is that the big difference here happens as soon as there is some education at all. So these three are lower than, than this one. So it's actually, it's not, it's, it's more like this lower social status actually sort of promotes higher wise reasoning um, rather than higher status. Well, not rather, but as well, both at the same time. And at the situational level, um, this is slightly different than the previous. Here, here you can see there's um, the lowest status and then these three kind of come together. Here it's a, a little bit um, different. The, the effect here seems to be more that when people believe they had much more status than the other person in their conflict, that's when they start neglecting wise reasoning in their in their conflicts. The rest of these seem to be sort of at the same at the same level. And I think that kind of makes sense too. Once you start thinking that you're way above other people, as can happen if you're a CEO or someone who's at the very top, a religious leader, it, it we, I think we find it when when we're not in uh, affected by it and we were watching these people make their foolish decisions it's like well it's so obvious that they think that they're the greatest so they make these risky decisions or bad decisions thinking they're so smart and really the rest of us can tell that they're really kind of being dumb and i think that this can sort of explain that effect any questions about this <clears throat> i'm just about done here um, I think I've talked enough and my throat is beginning to give way. So yeah, we can have some takeaways here for the predictive tests. Um, wise reasoning had pos uh, positive effects that we would expect in theory, in wisdom theory on general issues that are important to not just organizations, but also society. But what again, what I'm aiming to do is to sort of set a precedent so that we can start bringing the wise reasoning into the organizational studies. So my takeaway here is a little bit biased to my goals. Um, we see that wise reasoning has good effects on things that organizations struggle with, egocentric cognitive biases, uh, conflicted, conflictive attitudes um, and judgments. Um, wise reasoning is related to improved cooperation in general, uh, reduced intergroup biases and polarizations. So to me, I think feel like this has implications for science of wisdom at work. Engaging wise reasoning can help employees be achieve better outcomes at work, better teamwork, um, dealing better with diversity. And in my classes, I try to implement this as well because we have very multicultural classes and people and students coming from different fields of study who have different backgrounds and we have them work together. So part of our, um, well, not our, my um, strategy is at the beginning of the class to get them sort of using the wise reasoning sort of subtly um, in their practice of working together um, as, as teams. Uh, reduced bias at work, less discrimination. Um, as far as the contextual test, again, um, this finding that wise reasoning can be undermined by social class has implications to me. I think that this means, again, as employees move up in organizations and attaining leadership positions, they may actually become more foolish if they are starting to neglect wise reasoning. They may be more likely to not even notice or avoid solutions that can benefit the greater good 
and looking for solutions that is going to further promote them so that they, they can keep uh, rising, okay? So all of this has implications for science of wisdom um, at work and particularly, I think also uh, leadership, leaders who engage in wise reasoning may be more effective. They may be rated as more authentic, more ethical and considerate, okay? So at this point in my career, um, now I am in a management department with a research uh, position. So what I'm doing now is conducting studies along these lines. How does wise reasoning have positive effect in actual applied uh, contexts? Again, my voice is giving way. Um, so I think I'm not going to present these findings, but I can talk about them uh, with anybody if they like. Uh, we have some papers in, in uh, studies in progress and papers under review. This is one that's under review. But if you see these slopes here, this is almost exactly what how we found in the those intergroup bias studies. So this is an application to the perceptions of the gender pay gap. Okay, so men were more likely to deny the gender pay gap but with, as their wise reasoning goes up, their responses are less polarized and more like, more like women. Um, this is a paper um, that is with Ali Intazari, who is here. Um, I won't go over this too much, but we found that um, in, in my opinion, I think this is, is interesting because um, we're gonna end up finding that wise reasoning has important implications in unexpected contexts. So in this context, we looked at how people are, uh, data scientists are developing um, machine learning models. And we found that when we added the wise reasoning into the model, um, it, was, it was a significant predictor of more effective outcomes rather than if there was no wise reasoning in the model. And um, I've been talking about leadership and we are in an institute that's interested in wise leadership. Um, we've begun, this is very preliminary research um, with some colleagues here um, at UQ who have um, a lot of experience in the Army. Um, so we've conducted some studies in Army training. So people who are in the Army are going through their training. Um, I don't know what, what you would call it, but it's actual leader training where they are doing field exercises. So in these field exercises, they're in a um, in a group of people who are supposed to work together and they take turns doing these tough ch uh, field challenges. Each, each of them takes turn being the leader and then they rate each other after the challenges on how effective they were at, as a leader. Before they go out into these training exercises, we assess them on, on wise reasoning. And what we actually found was that and again, these are just preliminary. This is not published. It's not peer reviewed. So caveat here is that we found that um, pe the people who are using wise reasoning in their own com in their own conflicts were perceived by other people, their subordinates in these exercises, as being a more authentic leader, and that ended up improving the um, subordinates' trust in that leader. Okay, I think I'm done. Okay, so I think the upshots here is that wise reasoning is appearing to emerge as something that is helpful um, in just about any social organizational context that has a potential for conflict and that requires uh, cooperation. And I think that a big part of this is that um, the wise reasoning is uh, negatively related to these egocentric biases that tend to plague how we end up interacting with people and, and uh, being less ethical. So my, my question is, if it's so helpful, then why do people neglect wise reasoning? This, as I was um, going down this path and I was designing this measure, I wanted to look at behaviors, reflective behaviors that everybody is able to do that are not super difficult. You don't have to be a genius to do them. It's just a basic thinking process. So if it's so easy, then why don't people do it? And my suspicion is that when wise reasoning is needed the most is exactly when we don't want to use it, okay? So you think of yourself in a conflict with another person, automatic, our, our automatic reaction is sort of to protect the self, to think that 
I didn't do anything wrong. They're a jerk. They're attacking me. I'm a victim. And when we start to get into that mode, the last thing that we want to do is try to think about their perspective or show empathy to them because it feels bad. Okay, they're the bad guy. I shouldn't be taking their perspective. And I think that when that happens, it kills our motivation the same way that status can kill it. Um, and it ends up um, harming our ability to use wise reasoning and can actually end up having negative consequences all around. If you look at the results that I've presented to you today, this general finding of more biases and less cooperation for people who don't use wise reasoning this is, could potentially be explaining a lot of the negative problems that we see in organization and society and in our personal lives as well. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, SBJ Institute, um, Center for Wisdom and Leadership. Thank you, Professor Surya Tora for the invitation. Thank you, David Rooney for making the connection. And thank you again to the collaborators on these projects um, who have been an uh, immense help in helping me to um, run these studies. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Justine. Uh, I have uh, I have received two questions from uh, our Dean, Dr. Varun Nagaraj. Unfortunately, he had to drop off uh, due to uh, his other commitments. This okay. one question uh, is how this uh, Swiss scale, which <clears throat> you have developed, is, is different than Monica's uh, three-dimension wisdom scale. Yeah, her scale is um, is a trait scale, right? So you're, you're first of all you're you're asking the participants to rate themselves in general. Who am I? How am I like as a person? What am I like in general? That doesn't tell us anything. Well, it tells us a bit about how people re will react in different situations, but it isn't it isn't precise. So I think we, we know now in the research that personality can um, predict different things in different situations, but also, you know, even somebody who is, let's say, um, an extrovert, that doesn't mean that they're always going to be extroverted in this situation or that situation. And when you rate, when you ask people to rate at multiple time points, they can actually, sometimes they rate higher and sometimes um, they rate lower. So my scale is an actual process scale. So I'm asking people, what did you do? By looking at what did you actually do rather than what is someone's personality, um, we're, we're looking at things that people can change. So this is um, implicitly, this is about change and improvement, right? Personality is more about who you are or what you are. And wise reasoning is more about what you can do. If I don't have a wise personality, according to the personality theories, I'm kind of screwed. I just have to say, well, I'm not a wise person. So I guess I'm just going to be a jerk or do whatever I can to get ahead, right? If I think, no, I can actually do something about this, then it becomes a little bit harder to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, why would I, why would I not? Um, right. So this is more of a focus on on process. And also her her scale is more also has different, you know, dimensions. The same thing as um, the Saws scale by Jeffrey Webster. They have different dimensions, you know, like his scale has um, a dimension of humor. Right. So this one doesn't have a dimension of humor. I think that using wise reasoning can help you have a sense of humor. Like if you know that you're not always right and you figure out that you messed up and maybe you can laugh about it a little bit rather than just saying, thinking that you're perfect. But, but in technically my scale does not have that dimension. But the focus is on the context sensitivity and the process. Okay, thanks, thanks. One more question from him that uh, have you explored the connection between wise reasoning and creativity? Or do you uh, hypothesize that there will be some connection? <laughs> I have not done that explicitly. Um, we have, we've gone down that path a little bit, but it's not, um, it depends what you mean by creativity. So like in the negotiation literature, you have to be creative to come up with synergetic solutions, right? You can't just go with the fixed pie where, okay, we'll just split it all down the middle. 
well, nobody really wins and nobody really loses. But when you, in, in most negotiations, it's not a fixed pie and people end up leaving um, benefits on the table, right? So, so we have some studies and negotiations that are looking at whether people are able to um, come up with synergetic solutions, which is, I think, an application of creativity, but it's not, we're not um, testing whether people are like artistically creative, if that if that's what, what, what you mean. It's more like applied. Yeah. Oh, and we also have an, other studies where people who, uh, we were looking at um, people from uh, Hong Kong and they, we gave them like a scenario and how they would solve a intergroup sort of in, um, problem with people team teammates who are working from India and teammates who are working from from Hong Kong and the people who were stronger and wise reasoning were more collaborative but again I wouldn't say it's like creativity um, in the terms of artistic or anything like that Thank you. Uh, Edward has a question I think. Yeah. So my question was on similar lines uh, the slide where you had shown your sample questions uh, I think uh, uh, those questions also appear to be kind of uh, which would entice a socially desirable responses. So I, I wanted to understand what what was the what was the uh, what what did you do to reduce the uh, biases? Uh, the, the method that that we used was the event reconstruction okay. Okay. by so, by Kahneman. So when when we build the context we're thinking about the situation more rather than ourself. So if you're just thinking about yourself, you're more likely to be like, oh yeah, I was, I was the best. I, I did the best thing that I, I you know, I, I did five, five, five. It just answered like the top of the scale for everything. And what we find is that that's not what happens with this scale. I mean, you, out of a thousand people, you're still going to have some people that do that. But in general, we found that there's no, um, relation, right? So you actually, if you, if you think about it, if you do like this sort of thought experiment, there's a lot of people out there that would have, think it's socially desirable to not take the out groups perspective, right? So if you ask people, oh, you were in a conflict with somebody and I tend to take their perspective. No, that's like an indication of weakness. I'm not going to do that, right? So when we actually tested the same scale, without the event reconstruction method. And we created it into like a trait style scale, like our delts or like Webster. And we found that the R scale was then related to social desirability without the, without the event construction reconstruction. And when it's not focused on the process, when it's more like, how are you as a person generally, it was, related to social desirability. Oh, Bernard has just posted a uh, paper on- Thank you. Yeah, so Sternberg has talked about creativity and wisdom a lot. Yeah, so theoretically there is there is a, um, a link, but his, his thoughts on creativity is more about coming up with creative solutions to big problems, I, I think. I could be wrong. Is that, is that what you're thinking too, Bernard? Uh, oh, just quickly, um, uh, he. Um, I guess what Sternberg is saying is that creativity can be great, <laughs> but that there there is a dark side to creativity. You know, like um, psychopaths can be really, really creative and what you know, uh, nastier and nastier yeah. things to do. Um, so creativity in itself uh, is uh, is is not necessarily guided by wisdom, nor is it wise in itself. Uh, it's always the end to which it is directed. Same, same as intelligence. Intelligence is great, but without wisdom, you can use it for all kinds of harm, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Yes, Prathana. Yeah, uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm Prathana Saitya, and uh, this is uh, like, uh, I'm also working in wisdom in the context of organization. So my question is, uh, like, uh, when we talk about the PMC model, uh, the as you, as you have mentioned, uh, the four component of PMC model in your uh, presentation also, 
do you think the dialectical thinking is uh, like when we talk about negotiation dialectical thinking have more importance in negotiation or all the components have the same importance well i think i think that's a great question um and i think this goes back to what i was saying about how it makes sense to me to be st stages of what we're doing but we haven't actually tested that like we you can't just take one away and then try to do the other one but you can i think you can do a thought experiment with that so if if you didn't take anybody's perspective if you thought you knew everything and if you didn't look at the context would you be able to do dialecticism i don't think so because you don't have the you don't have the contents you don't know what is the difference or what the other person's perspective is you don't know what the context is so you're not going to be able to come up with a good solution and you don't know what there is to balance because you just you you're stuck with your own perspective and it and it, you're you're still myopic right so you just have this this tunnel vision so i don't think that i don't think that you could do synergy without the other ones and and I, and and this goes back to what bernard is saying too like there's there's studies on um in the negotiation literature, there's studies on perspective taking alone. And in the intergroup literature, there's studies on perspective taking alone. And those that alone doesn't have to necessarily lead to more ethical outcomes. It also requires the other elements of wisdom because a, a, a Machiavellian is great at taking perspectives. That's why that person is able to ride other people so well because they know what other people what's going to make other people do what they want they know how to manipulate people if you if you don't have their perspective that i mean then you then you can't really do that but if you do have their perspective and you don't have the other elements of wisdom there's nothing holding you back from just being a utilitarian and being like well that's how i'm going to get ahead so i might as well do it because you don't have the extra element of the greater good right that comes with the the rest of the wisdom construct. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that's what we had. So thank you so much, Justine, for joining and uh, sharing this wonderful presentation on why you reasoning. And you particularly like the last quote that uh, it is exactly when it is needed, we fail to use it. So that is a gray area. and perhaps a pressing area where we would like to uh, focus more and do more research. I thank Professor Bernard, uh, I, I thank Dr. Ali for joining us and uh, being the part of more like a family than just a kind of a seminars that, uh, that, that are going. And I also thank research scholars. I also thank people joined from outside for this research seminar. And thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. And I wish you all a very happy and prosperous Diwali, which is coming up. And thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.